so much for being here. You can have a seat, and it is such an honor that you're here. My name is Mark. If I have not met you, I'd love to meet you before you head out to the parking lot today, and just make sure to, to not be a stranger, and make sure to introduce yourselves, and um, really, I am just impressed that you're here. In our meetings, we're like, we might have 20 people here today, because it's like 12 degrees outside, um, but thank you so much for being here and for braving uh, the weather um, so many of you, as you sat down, hopefully you saw a flyer on your seat. Um, that is something that is extremely important. Uh, we hope that that goes home with you, or that if it doesn't apply to you, that you can uh, hand that to someone in your neighborhood or your family. Um, so yes, we really are entering the year 2024 is a year, just really a year of the family. And many of you know this who've been with us for a while, but as a youth pastor in Oregon, I just saw a lot of brokenness and our middle schoolers, and our high schoolers, and family dysfunction, and all the stress and pain of these teenagers walking through life. And it's stressful if your home is together and things are, are, are functioning well. But there's this extra degree of pain. And even parents that were like Bible-believing, Jesus-following parents, a lot of them just seem lost in what it means to live as a family. And families were so busy, and just all going in different directions. And so I saw a lot, and maybe someday I'll write a book over my observations in those six short years of being a youth pastor, but we really want to do something to help you and the family. And so we want to kind of create a movement here in 2024 to start here with us and to be a beacon of light and hope uh, to the families. Um, so that is God's original government was the family, and it still is to this day. And so God has a lot to say about the family. So we're promoting this event in March. I hope that you sign up for this. Um, it's called the Family Teams Weekend. And you can hear from me. Um, I will be speaking about this until we get to that event. But I would love for you this morning to hear from my wife, um, just kind of her heart behind a Family Teams concept and the ministry and how she heard about them years ago. So Mel, why don't you come share um, from your vantage point, and then we'll have a little video for you guys as well. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I want to share is how did On Mission come to choose this weekend um, for us in March. And uh, it really started just over a year ago. Uh, Mark and I were just sitting in our living room, Christmas break I think it was. Um, and as we were, you know, reminiscing too from those days in ministry in, in Oregon, he goes, man, as I look at On Mission and we see all these young families and all these kids that are going to just rise up to be the next generation, right? What can we do to help prevent some of the bad stuff we saw? <laughs> what can we do? What tools, what more tools can we give? So he said, Mill, can you just find us like a workshop weekend to just give our parents more tools? And as you all have heard from him, I, I guess apparently I have grand ideas of starting countries and whatnot. <laughs> So I got excited about the idea, and I'm like, sure, 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 I'll find something. So go to my room, start a brainstorming session, and um, it didn't take very long. I remembered a breakout session from the IF Gathering, the ladies' um, yearly conference that we hold here in April, which, by the way, ladies, is coming up again. Um, and so in the summer, though, following this women's conference, we do little breakout sessions. And um, so but this was summer 2022. We were at Karen Daniels' house, and there was maybe six, seven of us ladies and we saw this um, session by a couple called Take Back Your Family. And it really, really had an impact on me. Um, the number one thing, he said a lot of great things about like family rhythms and God's design for a family and just really digging into the biblical purpose of family. But the number one thing that struck me was he went back historically and talked, kind of gave recent timeline of the family story starting at the Industrial Revolution and how what happened in the Industrial Re Revolution is that dad left what used to be his, his work, you know, his trade at home, based at home, and went out to the factory. And then soon enough, mom followed to her employment. Of course, kids then are in school, and everyone's going different directions. Now, you're probably thinking, that describes my life now. Um, and so... No, that's, it's not that your life now, if that's how it's ordered, is unbiblical necessarily. Um, but what, what this, this couple who's leading the session was saying is that what happened then with that progression is that work was only done outside the home, and the home then became a place only for rest, relaxation, and then eventually to much more consumerism, entertainment, and the heart of the family became more about consumerism, entertainment, relaxation, rather than work. Now, don't get me wrong. It's good. He was saying, too, like, we need to relax with our families. 
But what we've lost in modern society is the concept of working with our families. Um, so I loved that session, and so that took me down a rabbit trail, and I, I looked up his name. So his name is uh, Jefferson Bethke, and his wife is Alyssa, Alyssa Bethke. So I looked up their names online and found that they partner with this ministry called Family Team. Sure enough, look in navigating through their website and fi find out that they have a weekend workshop. And I'm like, Mark, ba-boom, found it. I love this stuff. And not only that, but their mission, and I'll let you hear it in the video we're going to watch, their mission lines up perfectly in uh, with the title of our church, um, which, by the way, if y'all didn't know, On Mission was a saying that, that Mark and I already had before we came here to On Mission Church. Um, so it was just such a Holy Spirit-directed thing to be able to come, move from Oregon, come here to Atlanta um, and serve at On Mission Church. It meant a lot to our hearts, and then now seeing that a similar wording and phrasing um, in family teams really meant a lot to us. So we um, have dug into this ministry. Re they have podcasts. They have a book Mark has mentioned before. It's really encouraged us in our family life. Um, and so check out this video, and then we'll wrap it up here. Hey guys, Jeff here. You're probably wondering, what is a family team? We talk about this word, you see this language a lot if you're here on our site or on social media, and you're probably wondering, what exactly is that or what does that mean? First, we have to talk about the fact that in the West, we have a particular view of family. We believe family is nothing more than uh, a springboard or a launching pad for the individual success of each member of the family. We're hyper-individualized. The individual is the most important thing at the expense and cost of the family. And a lot of us subtly believe that, that family is actually the thing that gets in our way of our dreams, our hopes, our passions, and our goals. But when we turn to scripture, we see something better, richer, more beautiful, and deeper. When you go all the way back to the first page of scripture. What we see as family is not as a hindrance to God's blessing in the world, but actually one of the primary, not the only, but one of the primary vehicles to bring his blessing into the world. When God wanted to bring his order into the chaos, when he wanted to bring his beauty and goodness and flood the earth with his presence, how did he go about doing that? Did he create a robot to do it? Did he create an app? Did he create a board of directors? Did he create a nonprofit? No, he actually created a multi-generational family team on mission, male plus female in this marital team. And then he said it's going to be multi-generational because it's gonna take generations to do this job, be fruitful and multiply. And then he gives them a mission go create and cultivate order out of chaos. And we found that recovering that ancient picture, that biblical wisdom of living as a family team that he recapitulates, by the way, in Noah, when he sends him out of the ark and says, no, 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 be fruitful and multiply and go bring order out of chaos. Abraham, same thing where we see Abraham say, I'm going to make in you a new nation, a new family. And then that culminates in Jesus, who then creates the biggest family of families, the new family of God. And so what we see from page one, all the way to the end of scripture is a God who actually delights and purposes multi-generational family teams on mission to be one of his primary vehicles for blessing and bringing goodness into the world. And when you understand that, when we have these epiphanies, it invigorates us, recaptures our family for flourishing, for integration, for joy, and for life. And so if you're here on this site or you've heard of family teams, then that's what all of these things are pointing back to. The books we have, the courses we have, the live events we have, they're all us trying to equip and encourage you and put new tools in your toolbox. Because when you do opt out of the Western family experiment and go back into this ancient design for God's family teams, then what you see is there's a lot less tools over here. And so we want to equip you. We want to put tools in your toolbox and everywhere on the site or down here, you can find that as well. So we love you guys. Hit us up with questions. Let us know. And we're excited that you're here. So I just want to end with um, come to family teams. It is that the weekend's going to be for, it is for adults, so parents, uh, guardians, single parents, anyone who has a dependent, even an aunt or an uncle, a dependent um, that they are caring for, uh, come and sign up for the weekend. I think it's really going to encourage you. But if you don't have any dependents you're caring for in your home, um, then please still get in familiar, still order the book Family Revision, um, still get familiar with the podcast from Family Teams, y'all, because all of us, whether we're grandparents, aunt and uncle, brother, sister, we're all born in a family. And it's a major part of our identity. Or if it isn't, if you've tried to, like, not get to that because it's been hurtful and broken part of your past, um, how can God help heal that um, with a new vision for your role in your family? Yeah, that's great. Well said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, thank you. Yeah. You guys, so I think you got the idea. Sign up. Dating couples? Sign up. Engaged couples, sign up. 
Everyone else, sign up. Just sign up. We'll find a way to, to get you into this. It's going to be an amazing event. I am so picky with conferences, events, speakers, so trust us on this one. We really want to make sure this is where we go, uh, this direction as a church. Well, friends, um, thinking about the family, we're in a series called Messy But Moldable. And um, yes, the family maybe that you grew up in has some issues, some wrinkles uh, that maybe never got ironed out. And yet we have this biblical model that God has set for us, but most of the characters in the Bible were a mess. So how do we, yes, we have this, you could say, descriptive ideas in Scripture and then prescriptive ideas in Scripture. So somehow they bridge this gap and figure out how we're supposed to move forward as, as members of God's family, but also members in the family that you're in. And last week we talked about Abram starting this story in the book of Genesis. And I want to encourage you, hopefully today you have your Bibles. Uh, make sure to bring a Bible next week if you didn't bring one today. Um, usually we have the verses on the screen today. Um, to save Todd's fingers from getting carpal tunnel, we did not do that because we're doing full chapters on a Sunday, which is a lot. Uh, so I hope you can bring your own Bible. But the recap last week was that um, God told Abram to go and to move. And God is the God of motion. And Abram went and he, he went and he moved and he went to this promised land. But on the journey, he noticed that his wife was very attractive. And so she was maybe in her mid-60s at that point, middle age back in these days. And so he said, hey, they're going to probably kill me because they see you. And so he decided to have her have the title of, this is you, my sister. And so we see this kind of half um, truth that we know was really a full lie from Abram. And so, so we see the mess that goes from there. So the people in Egypt where he is, they find out, well, why don't you just, don't, why don't you just tell us? So these pagan worshipers are calling him out. The guy who's worshiping the, guy, the God of the Bible, they're calling him out. And so they leave there, and their heads are hanging low as he has now taken these steps back, and his, um, his integrity has been smeared at that point. So all the people are traveling with Abram. They're seeing that he said this, this, this lie that went out. And so now he, there's a little bit of scarring going on. He made a mistake. So he, his name was smeared. So friends, what do you do in life? As you move forward in your life, you have your legacy that you're living, but then you make a mistake. And maybe this morning you're thinking back and there's still something that haunts you from decades ago that you did that is still lingering in the back of your mind. Maybe it was a past relationship. Maybe it's just a poor financial decision. Whatever that is, the list can be very, very long. We all have something in our past. It's often said that trust is lost in miles, but gained back in inches. And so we see this in the story of Abram, and see now he said these things, and the people that are traveling with him saw him make this decision, and to see now there's this, this, this humility that creeps into his life, rightfully so, in the life of Abram. But friends, we've all been there when it comes to making mistakes. About six years ago, I remember walking into um, the city jail, because yet again, as a youth pastor, I got a message that so-and-so was arrested. And so I had no idea signing up to be a youth pastor. I'd spend so much time in jail. At least once or twice a year, I was going to jail. It's not, nothing that I, I studied <laughs> in my studies was how to navigate these waters and to go to through metal detectors and deal with all these things that separated us. But to sit there, this one time I went into the jail. I went in to meet, I think his name was Jojo, who made some bad decisions. And as I was going to meet him, on the way there in the hallway, in the jail, I heard sniffles from someone sitting on a bench. I looked down, and I said, Tyler, what are you doing here? And his hands were in handcuffs, and he looked up, and he was weeping when he saw me, his youth pastor. Because he's always heartbroken. He's already heartbroken that he was there. But now to see me, he was embarrassed. And I was like, should we just have youth group here today, guys? You're here, you're here. You know, let's just, let's just uh, have youth group. So these moments of shame where they're just broken as these young guys have made poor decisions. But I remember saying to them, like, guys, don't you remember we've talked about this? You chose sin. Like, we've had messages about this. We've had small groups have cabin discussions about these things. Why did you step into this? Why did you make the decision that you made? They look down, they say, I know, we remember. I'm like, guys, well, you know what? The arms of God's grace are open wide. And you can start over. Repent, turn from those things. Move forward in his arms of grace that extend towards you. And so these guys would shake their heads and like, I know, I'm so sorry. Like, I won't do it again. Well, okay, well, I believe you. I'm, you're not in my hands right now. There's an authority that has you. 
So we'll walk through when you get out. But friends, so many of us have those things in life where you think there's no way God could forgive me because of what I did. There's no way. Well, friends, my one thing for you this morning is very simple. It's this. It's this pattern I see in the life of Abram is that we need to remember. We need to repent and then repeat. Remember, repent, and repeat. This is a cycle we see so often. And it's the same thing we should see in our lives because we are so frail, we often forget the goodness of God and we walk in things that are out of line with the Spirit, that are of the world, and then something catches our attention, and this is a sermon, some sort of podcast, or a friend who's a believer, something immediate. Someone says, hey, you're out of line. We're like, oh, yes, I remember. Okay, God, I'm so sorry. What am I doing? Not just to confess, but repent, and repent, repenting is when you actually turn away from that thing. And then often we have to repeat and go back again. So this is what we see in the story in Genesis 13. So now Abram, he's leaving Egypt here in verse 1. He's going up with all the people traveling with him. They're going up, and they have all this livestock. They have silver. They have gold. They have all these, all these possessions. They have a lot of stuff as they're traveling. So now he goes up there to the place, starting over again, to a place where he had made an altar at the first. And there, this is in verse 4, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. So he remembered. He remembered the goodness of God. He remembered all these things. And remember that that. God had told Abram, he said, oh, bless your offspring. Well, they didn't have any kids at this point. We talked about this last week. If you get this, this blessing from God, it's like, Abram, they're not going to kill you. <laughs> There's this immunity bubble around you at this point, buddy. Easy for us, right, today to look at it from a different lens. So now he remembers. He builds this altar. He calls upon the name of the Lord. And I think there's repentance in there as he goes before the Lord. He says, hey, I've done the wrong thing. Now I'm heading the right direction, leaning into you and trusting you. Well, friends, in this, the world is watching. And so often in our Christian walk, we make decisions that are sometimes good, and sometimes we make decisions that are not so good. And I'm often reminded that the world is watching us like hawks. Everything we don't say, the things we do say, the things we post, the comments we have, the likes that we have, things in the digital world. And so we're being watched more than ever in modern times about our Christian witness. Well, if you're born again, do you live different? Or are you just like everybody else in the world? And so in this, we see now that the world is watching because the servants are probably talking about Abram's choices. They're probably spreading the word about this guy. And so now in verse 5, Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds he and tents. He had a bunch of stuff. So that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. So we have a conflict already. There's this clash you have your people and your stuff. I have my people and my stuff, and we're not gelling well in this land. There's a conflict here in the text. So the possessions were so great they couldn't dwell together. Verse 7, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So now, this all goes back to that God told him to leave his family. Abram, go without your family. And he brought his nephew Lot. And we know the rest of the story. If you've moved ahead, if you flip forward in the, in the scriptures, you know that Lot is going to be baggage in different ways. And now we see the beginning of this. There's this, this split is developing in their relationship that has issues. But a lot of this has to do is just because they had a lot of stuff, material possessions. For whatever reason, they had gained a lot of these things and they had wealth, but there were some issues because of their stuff. And like us today, a lot of our conflicts are because of our stuff, our things. I know some of you are in the process of moving. I know Gardell and, G and Jeannie are taking the brave step of moving. When you do that, you see all of your stuff. And I try to encourage people every five to ten years, just move, even the house just next door, just move so you can do inventory on your stuff. Throw away most of your stuff. Like in our shed, I'm like, if I haven't touched it for a year, it needs to go away. Just stuff. We have so much stuff. Well, this stuff causes stir and a poor witness of who they serve. Well, friends, I'll say this. Oftentimes there are barriers from the world that's out there. And maybe this morning, if you're not fully a, a Jesus follower yet, there, there are these barriers that we can have that can turn the world off to the good news of Jesus. And so sometimes it's the bickering, it's the strife, the disunity. They're, they look at that and they're like, well, I don't want anything to do with that. 
if this is giving me a glimpse of Jesus, well, then don't, don't sign me up. But I really see two camps in this when it comes to today. It's kind of a two-way street. There's so often people say, well, I want to become a Christian. I want nothing to do with Christianity. The God of the church, I want nothing to do with him if he is real because the Christians are so judgmental. Someone said something to me. Or people have left the church because someone said something that might have been judgmental. And friends, I will say this this morning with all caution and respect. I will say this. Oftentimes, it's because a Christian called out someone's sin. And that person was offended. And they didn't like how they felt. And so they post how the church is now evil because someone said something. And another camp of people I hear, they want nothing to do with the God of the Bible. It's because... They're seeing those who say they're Christians, but they don't live a life like Christ. And that's been me on many occasions. I have not shown the fruit of the Spirit. It's embarrassing to look back in my own life. I remember that time vividly in sixth grade when I'm sitting next to Michael in band class, my friend Michael, and Keith goes to the bathroom. And I see Michael take these six thumbtacks, the same color of the plastic chair. He puts them face up. And so I'm watching this kind of laughing. Michael thinks it's hilarious. People think it's all, they're all being quiet because Keith is coming back any minute now. I remember this moment when Keith walks in. I'm sitting next to him and I say nothing. And Keith sits down and he screams as those tacks go into his flesh. I remember that moment thinking, what is wrong with me? And the teachers are involved, principals involved. And they, they said the same thing. They asked the question anyone should ask, Mark, why didn't you say something? Well, it's because I was weak. I was weak. It's those moments of weakness where it's so easy to go with the flow. And today, I still regret that. And I don't know where Keith is today, but if you're watching, I love you, and I'm sorry if you're tuning in so many years later. That was a long time ago. But often, it's times that just our character does not line up with what people think of the God of the Bible. These become barriers. And the last thing is really disunity. The bickering in churches. I'm sure you've heard about it. But why can't we make the sanctuary carpet green? Also, no, it has to be magenta. No, it has to be gray and neutral. I've seen some, not here, not here, other churches, you know, other churches seen these conflicts. But it's so amazing when the world sees that. They're like, you guys don't have unity. And yes, oftentimes it doesn't mean uniformity. There's a difference. Even theologically on our staff and with others, we might see some things differently. But we have a uniform approach moving forward to make disciples. So the world is watching. And now all these servants and all the people traveling with him are watching him, checking on him now as he's trying to rebuild inch by inch this integrity and this trust that was lost. Well, friends, now Abram is remembering. And he's remembering that he's trying to build back his integrity. In verse 8, then Abram Abram said to his nephew Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, the land on the left, I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Well, this is so unique because Abram was older than Lot. And historically, he should have seniority to make the decision. But Lot here is trying to right these wrongs. He's saying, why don't you just choose, and whichever one you choose, I'll go the opposite direction. I'll do it with the opposite of what you want to do. So he's trying to rebuild his integrity, trying to give and to give and to show people he's rebuilding this. Rebuilding his, his integrity. And so now, in this too, I see a unique idea that comes out of the text. So often we can have people in our life that are a poor example spiritually to us. And I do believe that, yes, we're supposed to pursue people, but there is a line, I think this is where the Spirit of God gives us this discernment in this line, of where we need to just cut the cord in contact with those people. If there is someone in your life that is pulling you away from the truths in Scripture, away from walking with Christ and walking in the Spirit, maybe there's a season coming up, maybe soon, where you need to cut that cord with that person and be removed from them. Because we're sponges too, right? I'm still absorbing around people. It's natural. But friends, here he's trying to rebuild his integrity slowly by cutting this cord and going inch by inch And now, this is important in verse 10. Now, Lot, imagine this, they're traveling. He lifted his eyes, this is key, remember this, 
Lot lifted his own eyes on his own his own prerogative, he lifted his own eyes. He saw the Jordan Valley, it's well watered. Things were beautiful, gorgeous land. So excited to move forward, beautiful. All this land was gorgeous. Now down to verse 11. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. So they separated that point from each other. And verse 12, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. If you know anything about the Bible, you know at this point there's some drama brewing. If you know anything about Sodom, if you've read anything in the Old Testament, Genesis, if you read about Sodom, uh, you know where the story is going and this anticipation is building up. So now Lot is deciding to move close to Sodom. And it says this in verse 13. Now the men, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. But in this moment, I feel like Lot, when he lifted his his own eyes and he looked, he said, that looks so appetizing. That's amazing. Look at Sodom. Look at the landscape, the water. Look at the nightlife in Sodom. It's like vibrant. There's this pulse going on. Maybe he heard some beats in the distance. Something pulled on his heart to go check out this area. So he went. And that's where he put up his tent. But friends, as Jesus followers... The Bible is clear that we, and often at times it talks about this journey of the Christian life as a walk, and sometimes I feel like I'm running, I have to pull it back a little bit, sometimes I feel like I'm crawling, but there's this, this imagery of a walk, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he says this, he's trying to unwrap the idea of the, the resurrection, and he says this in the 7th chapter, he says this, being about the body, being in the body, but absent from the Lord now, knowing that someday we will be absent from the body, but present with the Lord. And he says this key thing I love so much. Paul says this, we, so the Christians, we walk by faith, not by sight. And this is what the world does not understand. It is so, we baffle their minds to think about that. We walk by faith. So maybe God has called you to something that doesn't make any logical sense. Like me talk to that coworker about my faith, me move here, me support the mission field, me go on a missions trip. So walking by faith, it doesn't look glamorous. It doesn't sell. It's not flashy. Super important for us to understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. When college students say when they graduate from high school, Mark, I'm so excited I got into this amazing university. It's amazing. Top university in the in the country. I like to look at them and say, Well, that's great. Have you have you researched the local churches there around the campus? Well, no, no, no. But 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 anyhow, I this is the degree I'm gonna get. I can get this internship for a year after and and I'll I'll be making like six figure salary, you know, within a year when I graduate. I said, That's cool. That's awesome. Have you researched any campus ministries that you can be a part of, you know, to grow in your faith? You know, no, no, I haven't done that yet, but, but, but I, I get, a, like, this massive scholarship from the wrestling team, and it's going to be amazing. They cover so much of my cost, and it's going to be great, and I, I just want to look at them and just say, well, that's great, but what is your plan to fight sexual immorality while you're on campus? What is your battle plan? Digitally? In person? Well, I just won't look at girls, and you know, I'm just gonna, oh, oh, okay. You know, but friends, so often, and we chuckle this morning, but so often, we look at something that's so appetizing. Maybe this new pursuit of a career, or a new home, or a thing, or a car, or maybe a different spouse. Something can catch your eye. And this is how Satan works, just to lure us with things of the world. But we're called to walk by faith, not by sight. So we're called to live different, and it's not easy. It's not an easy journey whatsoever. So we as Christians, we have this higher calling. And yes, sometimes it's just weird to be blind and to move forward and to walk in the Spirit, but that is what we're called to. And so now this is unique because this becomes a, a private conversation in the text. So now Lot has made his decision, nightlife in Sodom, lush, fertile land, amazing. And now we have the intimacy of this private conversation where God now talks to Abram. Verse 14, the the Lord said to Abram, I wish I could see this. 
the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. So who told him to lift his eyes? The Lord. Not his own initiative, not his own thing. The Lord said, Abram, maybe he's downcast, I don't know, maybe he's just, he said, hey, lift your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. It was a reminder to Abram of God's promise. Yes, Lot will have this section, but there's this umbrella promise, Abram, it's really all yours anyhow, because I told you this before and I meant it. And I'm going to follow through. And so he saw this. And, and Lot, he lifted his eyes on his own will and saw the things that were appetizing to him. But here we see God now lifting the eyes of Abram. And so now he said all of this land is his. So in this moment, I feel like this is a re reminder moment for Abram. Hey, remember, I told you all these promises. Remember. He says this in verse 16, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length of the breadth of the land, breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent, and he came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which were at Hebron. And there he did what I love so much. He built an altar to the Lord. So all this stuff is given to him. And God ordained it. He was in it. And the first thing he did is he built an altar. What a reminder for us, friends, in our busy life, first of all, as just you know in the Bible, <laughs> out of all creatures in the world, out of all the critters, the one animal that God chooses to, to compare us with, specifically in the New Testament, is a sheep. Very fitting, because we wander and we forget, but the grass is greener over here. You know, it's just the head's down, right? It's a perfect example. So friends, I want to encourage us this morning to remember God's goodness, remember his promises. And for some of you, that means when you reflect on that, there's a natural impulse to want to repent and say, God, what am I doing? Not just to confess, but to turn and shift and go away from that thing. And then we repeat it because we're fallen and we go back into those same habits again and again and again. So friends, this morning, I want to invite you into the concept of an altar, a place where you give something up. You have this memory of God. You, you need to lay down something in your life and surrender it to him, like Abram did in this text. So I want to give you a moment this morning as a church to view this stage as an altar. And no matter what you're going through in life, whatever battles you're facing, to know that, yes, this is a moment to, A, remember, and for some of you to repent, and then we repeat. So during our last song, if you feel led by the Spirit of God to come forward and kneel, I want to encourage you to come forward and kneel here at the altar up front. We will also have some people at the prayer crosses that would love to pray for you for whatever you're going through in life. And friends, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, um, we would love to pray with you that way you can step forward in faith and receive him as Savior today and start a new life born again. So friends, this altar is yours this morning if you want to come kneel. Jesus, we come before you so thankful. God, so thankful for you. Thank you for this example of Abram. But God, it's so easy to look back in life and see all of these mistakes that we've made. It's so easy to have this burden it's easy to have this idea, this weight that's in the back of the mind constantly burning, saying should have, could have, would have. God, so this morning I ask that anybody in the room who is still harboring something, that you can take that and remove it from this person. That you will take that burden and take it from them. And so God, for anyone in the room who needs to simply just repent and turn or confess and ask for your forgiveness, God. Have this be the morning where they will step forward. And so, Jesus, I know many people are fighting battles here in this church. And truly, the battle is yours. So help us to move forward as a church to walk by faith, not by sight, which is very daunting. But, Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness.